Hello everybody, this is Abby Alcox with Badgerland Journal Stories of Wisconsin. Back at it again with another episode. And today is going to be a two-parter. So we haven't had one of these since I did my episode on the German POWs. If you haven't already, go check those out. But today we are going to be talking about Eliza Williams. And I'm not going to get into too much about him yet, because that's ruined some of the fun. Um, But we're going to start somewhere a little bit different today. So our story is going to start at the Palace of Versailles with the death of Louis-Joseph, the Prince of France. And this death occurs in 1789, June of 1789 to be exact. And his death occurs shortly before the start of the French Revolution. And with his death, his younger brother becomes the heir to the throne, or the Dauphin. And so on August 10th, 1792, so three years later, the royal family is caught and imprisoned in the temple in Paris. His father, Louis XIV, is beheaded January 21st of that year. And those who are loyal to the crown despite the revolution announce that Louis-Joseph is king of France. Now in July of 1793, just, you know, about seven months later, he is taken away from his mother. They were imprisoned together. And he's put under the watch of Antoine Simon. Or Simone. I guess it depends if you want to say it with a French accent. (gasps) Um... His mother is then killed in that October, and he will live on past her in very harsh conditions. There are rumors that he is being tortured at the hands of his jailer, and he will eventually succumb to sickness, specifically tuberculosis, at the age of 10. Yet, because there is so much secrecy surrounding the later parts of his life, there is rumors that he has actually escaped France. And one such rumor says that he was smuggled out of France to North America, where the young dauphin is given to a Native American family to raise and protect. This family is the Williams family. So the story I'm going to tell you today is possibly the story of the lost dauphin of France. So we're going to go through this. And then I'll leave it up to you guys whether or not you believe that Eliza Williams is the lost dolphin of France or not. But prior to getting into the lost dolphin, we are going to backtrack in the Williams family history a little bit. All the way back to the 1700s. So we're starting with John Williams, who is a Puritan minister. Actually, he's Reverend John Williams. And they lived in the Deerfield Settlement in New England. And in 1704, there was a famous raid on Deerfield. And like I said, it's the settlement that the Williams uh, family lives. And so a bunch of Mohawks come in and they raid the settlement and capture multiple people, including the majority of the Williams family. While bringing the Williams family back to the Mohawk settlement, they actually end up killing his wife. She was pregnant at the time and she was slowing the group down. And after a decent time in captivity, he will actually find a way to pay for his freedom. He will return to New England where he will then start negotiating for the return of the rest of his children that were still remaining with the Mohawks. Now, Eliza Williams, I believe it's great-grandmother, she is the only one that does not return. She's young at the time, and eventually she will go on to marry a Mohawk. And so she does not ever return to New England, despite multiple attempts by her family to bring her back. And so she will end up having three children, one of whom is named Sarah. Sarah's husband is not identified. Later in Eliza Williams' life, when he does a history on his family, he will claim that she married a doctor named Williams. So securing, because at this point his uh, grandmother 
would be half Indian, half uh, white. So in saying, well, she married a white man, it secures more of a white lineage because we are going to see the more Eliza Williams' life goes on, the more he tries to hide or diminish his Native American origins. And to be honest, it's very unlikely she actually married a man named Williams. It's more likely that when Native Americans were dealing with Europeans or white settlers, they kept the English name because it was easier for them. And they're just like, whatever. They don't have the passing on of names in the same sense that we do, where you take the paternal name, not the maternal. So Sarah has children, specifically Thomas Williams. And this is going to be Eliza Williams' father. Supposedly. If he's the dolphin, then he's his adoptive father. But he was considered a well-respected Mohawk leader. His wife that he married, also of mixed descent. Now, you're probably wondering why I just went back four generations in the Williams family to explain this. And the answer is just because um, the original grandmother or great-grandmother chose to stay with the Mohawks doesn't mean that they lost contact with the Williams family in New England. In fact, over multiple generations, you had communications between the Mohawks and the Williams trying to secure connections and trying to bring that family back to New England, despite the fact that the family was now of mixed descent, which we will see later on, they do have prejudice towards. Which brings us back to Thomas Williams. And he actually played an important role in the Seven Nations of Canada Treaty of 1796. So what happened was there was two Mohawk men who did not represent the Iroquois nation, who did not represent the Mohawks, who sold New York to the colonists there. Now the Mohawks upset about this. They wanted to write this. They sent three delegates delegates, including William's father, to negotiate a true payment um, for the six-mile-long reservation at St. Regis and an annuity. So basically they're like, well, we can't stop this, but we would like to have some benefit of selling of New York since, you know, it's our land. And so through the three men, including William's, signed the Seven Nations of Canada Treaty. And for some, they see this as the Magna Carta of the, you know, Iroquois Nation, kind of the, which I don't understand that interpretation quite as much. I, you know, only go so far in this research. Or the world's biggest swindle of the St. Regis Reservation today. Like, so people are very divided. They either see this kind of as a founding moment for the nation or the biggest swindle. I personally would probably go with the biggest swindle, um, but that's just me. Um, but Eliza Williams will later write biographies on the three men who signed this, which was his father, Thomas Williams, Colonel Lewis Gray, Lewis Cook, and then William Gray. But because of this, there is tension already before Williams comes into the picture and ooh, does he create some tension with the Williams family and the Mohawks because some think he sold the Mohawks and the Iroquois out when he made this deal, when he legitimized it. And some will say he had no right to sign the treaty and sign away what he did because as what happened with many Native Americans during this time period is they signed treaties with the government saying, yeah, we'll give you this reservation. Then we'll also like give you continual payments so that you can live off of this land. You don't need all of the land around it. And then on the decades that proceed, it's an ongoing struggle to receive those payments, those rations, the food, any of it. So I can understand why people would be upset. Did Thomas Williams know that at the time? Probably not. And I just realized that I said that a little bit out of order. So this does actually occur, the Treaty of the Seven Nations does actually occur after Eliza Williams' birth. I don't know if he was there or not. Um, 
because it's possible he brought his son along. He was obviously not that influential because he was would have only been nine years old. Yeah, nine years old. Because he is supposedly born in Canada near the St. Regis Reservation at an unknown date. There is no record of his specific birth, just his bat just his baptismal record, which was around 1787. So we're assuming most of the time um, his mother was very Catholic. So I'm assuming, you know, that his birth occurred relatively close to around 1787. And it was, he was born to Thomas, as mentioned, and his wife, Mary Ann Williams. So he had a pretty unremarkable childhood. However, he would later claim that at one point he was swimming in Lake George near the reservation and he hit his head on a rock and all of a sudden memories started to come back to him. He realized that he had not, you know, actually been born in the Mohawk territory. He realizes that actually he arrived in Albany around 1795 with a guardian, Madame de Jardin. He was then passed to another Frenchman, who then brought him to his father, Thomas Williams. He also started to realize that he had these scarrings on his knee that was very similar to what the dauphin was supposedly had right before he died. So a scarring from tuberculosis on his knees. And so he's starting to, you know, make this connection that he might be the lost dolphin at a very young age. So, you know, like I said, probably only seven years old. He's starting to come back to these memories, he says. He will only say this years later. He, there's no record of him mentioning this at the time. But the St. Regis Reservation was actually a very diverse place. And this is because you had a blend of the French Catholics who were coming in trying to convert the natives in the area. But then you also have the Iroquois Nation, which I'm going to get into in just a little bit when we start talking about the Oneida. But you have these kind of different influences because the Mohawks made up the majority of the uh, natives that were in this area. But the Iroquois Confederacy brought all different tribes to this location. It was a mix. So you didn't have just Mohawks living there. There would have been Oneida. There would have been Seneca. There would have been multiple different tribes coming and living in this area. So Williams would have been exposed to a diverse group of people, which probably would have been kind of awesome. Like to, I think that hearing people's different experiences is an awesome opportunity to learn. But... He did not stay there, and he was not educated there. Um, his, him and his brother were actually sent to live with relatives in New England. And you guessed it, this is the Williams family that went back to New England, started to settle there. They reached out and said, hey, we will help to educate your sons to Thomas. And they agreed. Now, why did he do this? I think Thomas kind of understood the times. He understood that the white settlers were not going away. These were people that you were going to have to live with. So I think he thought that by having his son educated amongst the white people, that maybe that's going to give him a heads up, a way to navigate the world better, being able to speak English, understand their customs. So he agrees. And they went to school in the 1800s. And... He kind of hopped around from family to family, not in a traditional school necessarily, but being taught by often the mothers in the home. And, you know, they passed him along because take, they're taking on a whole nother mouth to feed. So often they only took him on for short periods of time. In 1807, he was actually sent to Moore's Indian Charity School in New Hampshire. Although it's said that he only stayed there a week. Apparently did not get along. Um, I did look this up because I remember from my Native American class, there was a lot of Native American boarding schools. Granted, this would be a little premature for the nationwide popularity of the boarding schools. 
popularity in a very sarcastic tone. Um, which, to some extent, yes. The Moore's Indian Charity School was originally started in 1735, and the goal was to turn natives into Christian missionaries, in which they could return to reservations to convert more people, and then he would, the founder of this school, would bring back the best and the brightest to teach the next generation of missionaries. And he saw the founder, a white man, of course, saw this as a cheaper solution to converting natives without paying white missionaries to do the job. So a little bit convoluted in my opinion, but it eventually would be moved to New Hampshire in 1770. And then it started to face difficulty over accusations of abuse, basically that the founder was forcing natives to do manual labor at kind of an extreme length duration. He was basically using them for cheap labor, um, which, like I said, not maybe that surprising. Um, but eventually, it kind of phased out from being a Native American school. By 1808, which is only a year prior to Eliza Williams, or a year after Eliza Williams supposedly attended for a week, only three of the 38 students was actually Native American. This school would actually end up closing, and this is your interesting fun fact, um, when it closed, all of its resources went to a different school located at the same location, which was Dartmouth College. Ba-bang. So some say Elijah Williams went to Dartmouth College, which, precursor, the school that kind of got turned into it. Um, but there you go, fun fact. So after all of this, Elijah Williams did end up becoming a congressional minister. He did kind of go into the ministry, which in a way was kind of his only option. Unless he wanted to stay on the reservation and not to say that wouldn't have been a viable option. But the only way a Native American was really being accepted at this time in New York, New England, was if he was a missionary. They saw that as a legitimate purpose. Otherwise, people weren't really welcoming of Native Americans. And in fact, his relatives told him such. So the t relatives that he had stayed with told him that he was only an Indian and he could not rise in society. So kind of gives you the perspective of what he's being told during this time. And I do think that some of this hatred towards being Native American gets ingrained in him and how he acts and how he views himself and other Native Americans. So before his career as a minister really gets kicked off, he actually gets involved in the War of 1812. Now his dad, and we'll actually talk a little bit about the Oneida in this in a little bit about this too, um, his dad in the revolution sides with the Americans, which is odd. The Mohawks during this time often sided with the British. They had a stronger connection to them. Um, this is actually going to be the downfall of the Iroquois Confederacy is the American Revolution. But his father, once again, sides with the Americans in the War of 1812. You know, where we did the American Revolution Part 2. Well, stalemate that, you know, kicked the British out. They tried to attack Canada. That was a fail. Fun fact, there was actually, which I have to do a podcast in, um, there was actually a battle of 1812, like the Battle of Prairie du Chien, that happened in Wisconsin. So, fun fact, we had a battle right here. Now you know. You'll know more eventually when I do a podcast on it. Anyways, so Williams likely got involved in the War of 1812 alongside his father, um, to the extent we do not know. Um, we can tell you some of the things he said he did. And if you notice, I keep saying he said he did this. I'm not saying he did this. Because as it will become clear, he is not always the most truthful human being and likes to say things that are going to advance his n interests and needs. Not always the interests and needs of the truth. So anyways, he will make these claims. There is no documentation to back this up, but he will claim that during the War of 1812, he was kind of a scout keeping track of, 
of enemy troops and their movements. Served in a ranger's unit, commanded an artillery unit. So, you know, in battle, commanding a unit during the war. Uh, was given the title of Superintendent General of Indian Affairs by the U.S. government, um, which you'd think that one would come with same some paperwork attached to it. Um, also claimed to have helped turn the tides of the Battle of Plattsboro, all at age 25. That's how old he would have been in the War of 1812, if he can be believed. So he did serve, like, don't get me wrong. Um... And the reason that the Mohawks often got involved in this was New Yorkers started to worry about Mohawks' loyalty. As I mentioned, they had sided with the British during the Revolutionary War. It's also important to note that the Mohawk Reservation straddles New York and Canada. And Canada, at this time, is a colony of England. So that you're going to have a lot of British support up there. So they were worried about getting the Mohawks loyalty because if they don't, then a perfect place for the Canadian troops or British troops to come through would be the Mohawk Reservation. And they did not want that. So the Mohawks had to start carrying passes saying that they were peaceful, which they did not like, kind of put a damper on hunting and trading. However, the Mohawks did pledge neutrality. The Revolutionary War had not ended well for them. There is, in fact, evidence that the British did approach Thomas William and try to convince him to have the Northern Iroquois nations join the British in their cause. He then moved a lot of his family and his friends to the American side of the St. Regis Reservation. It is around this move that Williams claims that General he Henry, General Henry, I can speak guys, it's okay. General Henry Dearborn approached him, recruiting him to be in the army. He claimed that his mission would be of the utmost importance. And if he failed, hundreds of thousands of people would die. Also claimed that this is the time when he was given the title of Superintendent General of the North, Northern Indian Department and Commander of the Corps of Observation. That was kind of long. Do you think they could come up with shorter names? Like, was that ever really a thing? Actually, it was a thing. At one point, the British gave it to someone else, and then he kind of mimicked that title. So I blame the British for ridiculously long titles. This was not verified, likely was wrong, but Dearborn did recruit Williams to help with correspondence between the Iroquois chiefs and the American army. He was in at least one firefight, whether he was actively in battle or just got caught in camp when a small British forces were kind of attacking. It, that's more likely because he spent most of his time in camp. If you're decoding messages and communicating between two groups, you're going to be in the war camp. You're not going to be on the front lines. While many of the Iroquois remained neutral, many supported the Americans hoping to maintain the peace. I don't think they really wanted to rile things up because that was the issue with the first war. When you have a lot of the Mohawks siding with the British while well, the British lose and you're staying with the Americans which you fought against. They understood at this point, we have to live with whoever wins. So you don't want to start going and making enemies cause more issues. Despite the desire to remain friendly and peaceful, it is um, going to be inevitable that the Americans start expanding that wish to push Native Americans off of their land because they're growing now. You know, they've defeated the largest army in the world twice. Well, the War of 1812 is a stalemate, but they didn't succumb to the British, so it was a win in their book. So I, I'm just giving you this context because the story of Eliza Williams, in a way, coincides with the story of the Iroquois Confederacy and the Mohawks and the Oneidas. And all of you are still probably, you know, we're <laughs> 24 minutes into this podcast and you're still sitting here going, Abby, how does this relate to Wisconsin history? Um, we'll get to that. Not right now, but we'll get to that. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's coming. Um, so after the war, Eliza Williams tries to gain a pension for his service 
and his father's service during the War of 1812. Now, it is verified, like I said, he was working as a uh, messenger between the tribes and the American colonel or general. It was a general. Um, he fails. And actually, this is an ongoing struggle of Native Americans who serve in the Civil War, who serve in different Indian Wars during the West, fighting against other Native Americans. They struggle to get a war pension that other soldiers would get. So I'm not discounting this by any means. So during this time, he also help, offers to help remove Native Americans westward in his attempt to get his pension. So he's going to the government saying, hey, give me a pension. I will help you with your attempts to remove Native Americans to the West. He, like I said, was looking for compensation for his father's service as well. And like I said, he petitioned con Congress, but his claim was rejected because of the lack of evidence he provided. He provided a letter from Dearborn himself. However, it was written in William's handwriting, which is kind of a theme that he'll be like, here, I have this letter and then we'll look at it and it's like, oh, this letter that you claim is from this general or your wife or your father that looks exactly like your handwriting. No one could have figured this out. So the War of 1812 does not give him the fame or notoriety that Williams is seeking. So he returns to his original goal, original, a original, is a original a word? Probably not. Anyways, his original goal of doing missionary work. So he was trained in Longmeadow, Massachusetts, and he ends up joining the Episcopal Church in 1815. So a little bit after the war. So he was raised Catholic. He went to his Puritan Protestant ancestors, relatives in New England, and he decides on Episcopal, which is likely because he saw it as kind of a middle ground between the two. He was very flexible on his view of Christianity, and this is actually not uncommon for many Native Americans who were exposed to multiple ministers on the different reservations, not to mention, you know, they have their own religion. So I think that they were willing to adapt and take on pieces that they agreed with, and if they didn't really agree with something, then they're just like, I don't, don't jive with that. As mentioned when I was talking about the Moors, Indian Charity School, people saw him as a perfect minister for converting natives because he was Mohawk, which meant he spoke the language and he was a Christian and he had knowledge of Native Americans and their customs and could assimilate better, you know, didn't stand out. So he went back to the St. Regis Reservation to try and convert Mohawks and he fails big time. And he says that it is due to the Catholics poisoning people against him. That is a theme. Every time he fails in his ministering duties, he will claim that it is the Catholics having a conspiracy out to get him, turn people against him. But likely the actual answer is most of the Mohawks saw him as, as an outsider at this point. He didn't grow up on the reservation. He was sent to schooling outside of the reservation. Not to mention, uh, people didn't really like him because of what his father had done signing that treaty years earlier. They saw it as a betrayal, and so they didn't want connection with a man that they believed had betrayed their nation. So he actually will go on to minister for the Oneida. So I've been talking about the Oneida and the Iroquois and the Mohawks. So now I'm going to just take a second to kind of explain everything. So you have the Iroquois Confederacy, which originally was made up of five different tribes. You have the Mohawks, the Oneida, the Ayuega, the Seneca, Onondaga, and later on in 1722, the Tuscarero joined. I apologize if I just butchered those names. I know I said Oneida right, because their reservation is right outside of where I grew up. Um, but this confederacy, so basically, these were all distinct tribes living in the same area. So in the New York, Canada, kind of North American region, Northern North America region. 
So they began to organ- organize around 1517 and 1600s, and they were very well organized. Some claim that they are the like longest or oldest Demo- democratic confederacy in the world. And so what they did is they joined together and said, we are stronger together. So they make decisions based on consensus. What does everyone think? And if they can't come to a decision, they don't make a decision until they agree upon this. And this worked out well for a couple hundred years before the English started to come. But even when the English initially were here, if the Iroquois nation had wanted to wipe the English out, they could have. But they realized, okay, these people keep coming. Maybe it would be beneficial to make treaties to get to know them until they got so powerful that the Iroquois started to kind of fall victim to bad treaties, to the pressures of the white settlers coming in. So the Oneida are distinct, but not distinct. So like I mentioned earlier, the St. Regis had, St. Regis uh, Reservation would have had Oneida, it would have had Mohawks, it would have had Seneca and Tuscarero. Basically, you could go anywhere and you had similar customs. You had a language that maybe be different, but you could understand it, like different dialects more than anything. So when he returned from the War of 1812, when Williams returned, he had very few paths offered to him. And the attempt to convert the Mohawks had failed. And at this time, it's actually the Oneida who contact him because they are not pleased with the missionary on their reservation. So they say, come here, we would like to hear you speak. So he arrived to the Oneida Nation in March 23rd, 1816. Because he was Mohawk, he could speak easily with the Oneida. And the Oneida actually at this time were divided into two distinct parties. You had the Christian party and you had the pagan party. So the Oneida that had adopted Christianity and you had the Oneida who were hanging on to their traditional beliefs. And Williams actually during this time, and he will say this is one of the proudest accomplishments of his life, through his ministering, his teaching, he will convince the pagan party to abandon their ways and end up changing their name to I believe like the second Christian party of Oneida. And actually, at, during this time, you have the Oneida. This is kind of a preservation thing. So after the War of 1812, as I mentioned, they were under increased pressure. And so they were hoping by bringing in a Christian minister, by inviting some white people to live on the reservation with them, by also inviting Christian natives such as the Brother Town and the Stockbridge Indians from New England to settle on their reservation, they'd be, ap- be able to act as buffers from the English to say, hey, we're accommodating your ways, we're adopting your religion, we're adopting some of your practices, leave us alone, please. Like, we just want to be by ourselves, thank you so much. And a lot of the Stockbridge and the Brother Town natives, they're bringing with them literacy, the ability to speak English political connections, that Western agriculture. So they're hoping, you know, to build up a little bit of a buffer to be able to maneuver around these white settlers more. So I'm going to talk about because the Brothertown natives and the Stockbridge natives or Indians, they come into play later on in our story. So I'm just going to briefly give you kind of who they are, how they ended up here. So originally the Stockbridge were the Mohicans and they allowed the Europeans to start a village mission near them. This village was called Stockbridge. And at this location, you had other natives who were coming to the village, wanting to hear about the mission's teachings. um, And they became Christianized. And this tribe combined, granted they were mainly Mohican, but they kind of brought in others, Oneida, Mohawks, anyone in the area who wanted to learn about Christianity, and they were given the name the Stockbridge Indians. So, like I said, some were Mohawks, some were Oneidas, Um, and they will actually end up fighting for the Americans during the American Revolution. However, 
when they return, and actually they suffered huge casualties fighting for the independence of America. When they return, they find that they are no longer welcome in their village. Europeans have settled. They say, we do not want you here. You need to leave. The Oneida, who had also fought on the side of the Americans, see this, and they say, come here. Come to our land. We will let you live with us, and kind of adopted them in. Brother Town, very similar. You had a Christian native who gathered a group together, brought together under Christianity, and eventually was again pushed out by settlers once they had assimilated. And actually, you're going to see, and I'll maybe have to do another episode on that as well, because we still have the Stockbridge Indians in Wisconsin today. There's a struggle to be federally recognized. And I think part of that issue is how much they assimilated so early on versus other tribes hung on longer or enough of them hung on to traditions that the United States can't deny their claims. As I'd mentioned, the Oneida had also sided with the Americans during the revolution. And there was a battle of Oriskany in 1779 that resulted in huge losses for the Oneida. In this battle, they were not only fighting the British, but they were fighting other Iroquois tribes that had sided with the British. Now, during the war, tribes had said the Iroquois Confederacy as a whole had remained neutral, but individual tribes had started, or individual nations, had started picking sides. And in this case, the Oneida came face to face with people they would have considered their brothers, their own people. And so after heavy losses, after facing their own family or own nation, the Oneida decided that they wanted to avoid conflict. They no longer wanted to fight with their Iroquois brethren. And they realized that their fellow Native Americans were not the enemy. When they took sides, they were basing basing the sides on who they believed would benefit them the most. And it left the Oneida and the Iroquois nation weakened because you had this strong confederacy and all of a sudden you had fighting each other. I mean, tribes were fighting each other. And so this left Oneida weakened. It also left the Iroquois confederacy as a whole weakened. They couldn't function the way they once had. And so actually, if you look it up, the Iroquois nation still exists today. There's a connection between these nations because all the nations still exist today. They didn't just disappear. (laughs) Granted, they're spread out further now, but they are still an organization that exists today that still has influence on these communities. So that being said, after the revolution, the Oneida are trying to find a way to survive. They're trying to adapt certain European practices and disregard others. For example, there are some agricultural techniques they disregard. They also refuse to put up fences. They see land as communal. So they're not necessarily giving into that as much. Despite the state and federal government saying, okay, we're going to protect these Native Americans, we know how that ended up. Oftentimes, treaties are disregarded, um, not paid attention to. People just do what they want. Um... So, like I said, Eliza Williams comes in and he actually makes progress with the pagan Oneidas because he was listening to their issues. Williams was a charismatic leader, a speaker. People wanted to hear what he said. Was he, what, what he was saying was maybe not always the truth, but he was good at talking to people. And he was able to teach them in their native tongue, which I think was also the other issue. You had missionaries coming in, not making an effort to understand the people, understand their language. Well, he had some of that. So he was able to use that to connect with them. And he will eventually, after his success with the Oneida, attempt to visit the Senecas, where he had ulterior motives. He wanted to help the Ogden Land Company acquire more land. So he would actually go around speaking at conferences and his experiences, his story about an Indian converting Indians. He's trying to build up that notoriety, build those connections, for example, with the Ogden Company. So 
what actually ends up happening, which is really messed up and convoluted, but you need to understand it, is at this time, they didn't consider well, Native Americans as uh, actual people. So while Native Americans had claims to land, the Supreme Court had ruled that Native Americans only had right of occupancy. So as long as they were on the land, they had the right to the land, but they could not sell the land. They could not trade the land with anyone that wasn't the government. So what this ends up happening is the Ogden Company, which is why they want them off, they somehow bought the rights to the land before the Native Americans had left. So as soon as the Seneca leave, the Ogden Company can come in and purchase the land and they have the monopoly on purchasing that land. Super convoluted. I don't understand how anyone thought this was a good idea or right or just. But anyways, Eliza William becomes a pawn in this plot to get the New York Indians, so the Iroquois Nation, off of New York land. Even though it's not New York's land, it's the Iroquois' land. But that's a whole nother issue. So with the connection starting between Williams and this Ogden company, this is also the start of removal for the Iroquois nations in New York. There was being pressure, there was pressure being put on the Oneida and the Stockbridge Indians, the brother towns, to move to Wisconsin. Williams probably saw this as a good idea. There will be claims later on in his life that he wanted to create a great Indian empire in the Wisconsin wilderness that he would be the king of. This actually, for once, might not be William's exaggerations. <laughs> this is someone else's. So later in his life, in 1856, 1876, and 1879, so actually some of these are after his death, a man named Albert Galayton Elias published writings about Eliza Williams, I actually believe in the Wisconsin Historical Magazine, Wisconsin Magazine of History. Or they published it again, anyways. But he published writings on Williams. He was not just some random guy. He actually was a protege of Williams. So Williams was kind of his mentor. And he was actually an Oneida that had met Williams and had studied under him, worked for him. And he claims that Williams took all the credit for all of his work. And this was the three years that Williams was with the Oneida trying to convert them. He will actually come to Wisconsin with him. He's the one that claims that Williams wanted to establish this empire or confederacy of natives west of Lake Michigan. And this has actually been repeated by many historians. It also appears, um, this story, but this story also appears around the time of his claim to be the lost dolphin. So exaggerated claims years after. Um, but honestly, Ellis, I mean, he saw him as a con man. He's, Ellis saw Williams as a con man and as a fraud. He might not have been completely wrong on that, but I think that when you look at his writings, it becomes clear that he had a prejudice against Williams. He did not like Williams, and there are certain things that I'm sure Williams did that was deserving of some dislike. But you can't really trust that he wanted to make this empire of natives west of the Michigan, Lake Michigan. Mainly because the idea to move the Oneida to Wisconsin was not even his plan, and this is recorded. It was Reverend Jedediah Morris who believed natives should sell their land in the east and move westward. Eliza Williams was contacted by Reverend Morris to help facilitate this. So he would gather the Oneida and speak to, like, speak to them and say, hey, you should listen to this reverend, he's got some good ideas. And as mentioned, it's very likely Eliza Williams did see removal as beneficial to the Oneida. So he attempted to convince the Oneida, Stockbridge, Muncie's, Brother Town, Seneca's of Sandusky, and other Canadian, tribe, Canadian tribes to move to Wisconsin. 
I'm going to go into more depth about that next episode, but he does help to negotiate land in Green Bay to be set aside for them. And so in 1822, he will end up starting to move some of these Native Americans. So 150 Oneida from the first Christian party, interestingly, the party he did not convert, and 150 Stockbridge Indians to Green Bay. And more would come in the following years. The Ogden Company, as I mentioned, gained the right of first purchase of the land um, of the Senecas. So if they ever leave, Ogden Company would get the first purchase, which means they are constantly pushing the Seneca, they are pushing Williams, they are pushing anyone to get the Seneca off the land. And now you're going, Abby, you have been talking about the Oneida and the Stockbridge leaving their lands. Why are we talking about the Seneca? They are not the ones that came here. What, what, what do? (laughs) And the answer to that is the Ogden Company believed that Any pressure on the Iroquois nation, because they were connected, if they could push the Oneida off, if they could push the Mohawks off, if they could push the Stockbridge Indians off, then it would be more likely that the Seneca would follow their fellow, like, tribes, nations, out of New York. The other key difference between the Senecas and the Oneidas is the Senecas actually end up having Quaker missionaries come in. And these Quaker missionaries know that the Ogden Company is up to no good. And so oftentimes you have white people with power that have the ability to stand up to these other white people. And they kind of protect the Senecas and say like, no, we are going to advocate for you. We are going to help you preserve your land. The Oneida had no such ally. The only ally they really had at this time was Williams, who was in favor of removable removal. And it is at this time when he starts pushing for people to leave their land that some Oneidas begin to distrust him and start calling him out on lies and saying, what are you talking about? You don't have the right to speak for us. This does not stop him. And there are multiple expeditions to Wisconsin to set up this settlement. And yes, that is how I'm connecting this entire episode to Wisconsin is the lead up of how Williams is going to bring the Oneida Nation, along with the Stockbridge Munsees and Brother Town, to Wisconsin. So he's not just the lost dolphin. He's the reason that we have some of the Native American nations in Wisconsin that we do. Maybe not the only reason, but a big one. So we are almost 50 minutes into this podcast. This has got to be the longest one where I'm just speaking by myself. I am going to leave it there, though. This is a two-part episode, so you are going to have to tune in two weeks from now to listen about the adventures of how (laughs) this played out, how bringing the Oneida to Wisconsin, because, you know, it wasn't all roses and daisies. There was some conflict going on. But then we're also going to touch back on how I started this episode, because Oh no, we are not done with the claim to be the lost dolphin. In fact, there is a visit from a actual prince of France to Eliza Williams later on in his life. So if you're interested in that, you need to check that out. But before we go, I do have to say, say, thank, do a shout out to my brother, Sam, who got me this awesome microphone that I'm currently recording on. So if you're saying you're going, wow, Abby, this audio sounds really nice, real nice, especially for you recording this in your kitchen, in your apartment, you can thank my brother, Sam, because he's that great of a big brother that he got me a microphone. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to mention, if you are in like Milwaukee or De Pere, or anywhere that you would like see me and you know me on a personal level and you want a Badgerland Journal sticker, let me know because I now have a few of those and you know, I'm trying to promote the podcast so I can give you a sticker and I can give you a sticker to give to your friend as long as you place it somewhere public so you can make other people see it so we can get more listeners. Yeah, that was my plug. So, and if you can't do any of that, maybe just share this with a friend if you really like it. And let us know what you think so far. Are you intrigued? Do you think Eliza Williams is lost often? Let me know what you think on our Facebook page, at Badgerland Journal, or our Instagram page, at Badgerland Journal, or send us an email at badgerlandjournal 
at gmail.com. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.